Welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about Neisseria meningitidis. Right, so I already introduced this in the previous video, right? You can click the link on the top right corner and watch the video, right? Okay, so we are going to start uh, with the reservoir, right? Uh, the reservoir for Neisseria meningitidis is nasopharynx of humans and humans only. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, the immunity against this bacteria can develop to particular strains, not all the strains, right? Because there are different strains. I'm going to explain them uh, later in this video, all right? This parasite is strictly for humans. It only affects humans. Uh, it can spread by respiratory uh, transmission, all right? So I, I said uh, is it normally colonizes the pharynx, all right? So you can, uh, particularly the nasopharynx, you can see the nasopharynx has three parts, right? Uh, laryngopharynx, oropharynx, and nasopharynx, right? So this region is uh, the one which is usually colonized by Neisseria meningitidis. All right, let's talk about the morphology and metabolism of this bacteria. This bacteria is kidney-shaped with concave sides facing each other, forming an appearance of a donut, right? Uh, again, it's a gram-negative diplococci, I told you this. Uh, is facultative anaerobe. Uh, it grows best in high carbon dioxide environment. Uh, and it has the ability to, fem to ferment both maltose and glucose. Now, this is very important because it helps you to differentiate between Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Right. So you can see to remember that it can ferment both maltose and glucose. In, many, in the word meningitidis, you also find M for maltose and G for uh, glucose, right? Neisseria gonorrhea, it only ferments glucose, not, not, not maltose, just to remember that. Okay, so uh, under the microscope, it looks like this. You can see the diplococci, right? Okay, so... Uh, Right, so here I represented uh, the diplococci so that uh, it will just remain there so it you remember later uh, in the examination, of course. All right, okay, so let's continue. All right, so uh, let's start with the virulence factors. All right, so the virulence factors, the main one is capsule, right? Capsule to... Uh, uh, to evade phagocytosis and uh, like there are 13 serotypes based on antigenicity, antigenicity of capsule polysaccharides. Uh, so serotypes A, B and C are associated with epidemics uh, of meningitis but type B is uh, most common. All right. The second virulence factor is IgA1 protease, right? So this will cleave the IgA. Remember, it's pentameric, right? At the hinge, it will uh, uh, destroy that hinge so that uh, like the uh, mucosal immunity of the individual will be disabled, right? Uh, the next one, uh, this Neisseria meningitidis is a unique proteins that can extract ion from transferrin, lactoferrin, and hemoglobin, right? So these proteins they contain ion, right? So, uh, the the Neisseria meningitidis can take ion uh, from these proteins. And the last one, which is also important, is pili, right? So pili in Neisseria meningitidis is for adherence, right? For adherence to the host cells. Uh, and in Neisseria gonorrhea is is important uh, like for that antigenic variation. We will talk about it. Just stay tuned. Right. Let's talk about the toxins. Uh, the first one, you know it already, endotoxin, right? So it's lipopolysaccharide envelope protein. Uh, and also there is a low molecular one called uh, lipooligosaccharide or LOS, right? But I just uh, included one here, right? So I brought back uh, the general structure uh, of the cell wall, right? You can see here a uh, lipopolysaccharide, right? So it's the one which is antigenic and gram negative. Uh, in gram positive, we have a uh, uh, lipotechoic acid and tichoic acid, right? I talked about it in the introduction of bacteriology, right? Uh, but there is one thing you need to know because uh, gram positive bacteria and 
it, it, they can produce exotoxins, right? But Neisseria meningitidis, this gram negative one, it does not produce exotoxin, right? No exotoxin, right? You have to remember that. Right, let's talk about pathogenesis, right? Okay, just randomly, things which you just need to know. Uh, I said it colonizes the pharynx, right? So from the pharynx, it enters the bacteria. Uh, it enters the blood. What? The bacteria. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in blood, the LOS or the lipopolysaccharide envelope proteins, they cause inflammatory response. This will lead to increased vascular permeability, leading to leaky capillaries right so this will cause a particular rash right the symptom which you will see and that symptom indicate thrombocytopenia uh, again because of this leaky capillaries the the patient will have a hypovolemia uh, or shock and shock you if you know hypovolemic shock right you understand so this one is triggered by uh, peripheral vasoconstriction right so if there is uh, this massive vasoconstriction, it can lead to poor perfusion of adrenal glands, leading to a syndrome known as waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. What the hell? Let's just uh, like organize these things like at clinical basis, right? Let's restart. Okay, so first, firstly, I said it's, it normally colonizes the pharynx, right? So there is usually asymptomatic, right? So, Neisseria meningitis for meningitis, right? So, firstly, you need to know the symptoms of meningitis, right? They include fever, stiff neck or nuchal rigidity, vomiting, lethargy or altered mental status, and petechial rash, right? So, this is where you... Uh, is the infection of the meninges right what about in blood because like uh, there is another condition called a uh, septicemia or meningococcemia right uh, and the symptoms of this includes fever uh, petechial rash and hypotension all right and another one uh, I, I told you it's called fulminant meningococcemia which will lead to uh, waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome uh, and the and in this case there will be hemorrhage of adrenal glands along with hypotension and petechial rash, right? So this is what actually leads to death of the patient. Okay, I have some images here, right? Okay, so you can see here, firstly, uh, you can see um, the petechial rash. Okay, uh, and here I also have the brain, uh, like the the meninges right so you can see like this this hemorrhages on the meninges okay let's talk about diagnosis right so uh as you know the first one is gram staining of course right you see uh gram uh, negative diplococci like bean shaped right so you see this uh, after taking what uh like the specimen uh, you know, L3, L4 will do uh, like uh, take cere cerebral spinal fluid, right? Okay. So in culture, right? So culture, uh, the culture specimen on blood agar that has been heated to 80 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. So this is what what's commonly referred to as chocolate agar. Right, and the selective media, of course, it prevents the growth of other bacteria. Uh, and I told you, it's called Thermatins agar, right? Or uh, VCN for vancomycin, colistin, or PO, or, uh, and nistatin, right? Uh, okay, so here is another point. The cell wall contains cytochrome oxidase, which oxidizes the ditetramethylphenylene diamine okay one more time tetramethylphenylene diamine from colorless to pink right so this is what's used to id the colonies of neisseria meningitis right uh the other method of course is pcr polymerase chain reaction uh this one is to detect the uh, bacterial dna in clinical uh, specimens right what are the risk groups who are at risk of getting uh, Neisseria meningitis? The first one, neonates, 
right so neonates are susceptible from 6 to 24 months right when the protective anti meningococcal igg is low right so if you still remember in the previous video we covered uh, listeria monocytogenes right and i talked about uh, like the bacteria which affect neonates i said the first 3 months uh, men meningitis is caused by e coli listeria uh, and another bacteria which I mentioned. Please, uh, if you watched the video, tell me the third bacteria in the first three months, right? Then after that, then there will, we have two, uh, Nisera meningitis and Haemophilus influenza, right? Okay. Another group, army recruits, right? So army recruits are also at high risk with uh, carriage rates of greater than 40%. And college freshmen, all right? What do these last two have in common? They both live in closed quarters, right? Okay. What about uh, treatment? Okay, so treatment is always the final part, uh, the most interesting one. Okay. So how do you treat? The first thing, uh, you know, prevention is better than cure. So the first thing, vaccination, right? So there is a vaccine against capsular antigens, a. C, Y, and W135, right? So that is the only vaccine that is there, not for B, because uh, like we cannot make antibodies against the uh, B strain, right? Okay, uh, then if there is infection, of course, we use antibiotics, right? So the first one, penicillin G, right? The second one uh, is a third generation cephalosporins, uh, I gave an example of ceftriaxone, right? This is very important because these third generation cephalosporins, they have the ability to penetrate the blood brain barrier. The last antibiotic uh, which I want to mention is rifampin, right? So rifampin and ciprofloxacin are used for prophylaxis of close contacts of infected uh, persons. For example, you know, like uh, in a family, uh, one person has been diagnosed with uh, Neisseria meningitis. You need to to uh, give rifampin to those who are living with that person, right? Until next time, head bowed.